Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm Darius Mehta. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for joining me. I know you're such a busy man these days. I really appreciate your patience. I'm <laughs> juggling, uh, juggling, juggling a few, this is going to be the wrong analogy or metaphor, uh, <laughs> juggling a few hats. Okay. <laughs> that, I, that gave I, me I, a visual. <laughs> yeah, I, I wear a few hats and uh, trying to keep keep many things going at once, but I really appreciate your yeah. reaching out and finding me. And uh, uh, it looks like you're doing a lot of good work. Getting, Thank you. Getting the Zoroastrian ideas and the faith and how- Yeah. Weird. Well, it's so fascinating for people. Every time I mention that's my family's heritage, I get a lot of questions and I wanted to come and learn from an expert like yourself. So that's a good place to start is um, tell us about your background and the many hats that you are juggling. <laughs> Thanks uh, uh, again. And, and how, how may I address you? Sorry, um, you, can call me, you can call me Avija, which is the American pronunciation. But um, I called my mom today, I asked her, where does she find my name? And she said it was Avisha in the Avista book and it means special. Is there a way to fact check if that's correct? <laughs> I, I I can ask around. Okay. Uh, Aviche, she said? Yeah, yeah, she said that means special. Wow, <laughs> well, that's, that's a very, very, uh, very nice, uh, nice name to uh, to give. So uh, I can call you uh, whatever you like. Aviche, yeah. Avija. Avija uh, is uh, fine, Think that's how, uh, that's how I'm known. And how great. would well, you thanks. like to be addressed? Thanks, Avisha. Uh, Dariush is great. Yeah, uh, I use pronouns he and him, so feel free to Dariush. I, I have a PhD, uh, so some of my students, I, I should tell them not to call me this, but they call me Dr. Mehta, uh, as I am in an academic context uh, here. Yeah. So who am I? Yes. I have gone through life being trained as an engineer. I am one of three kids. I was born in Florida mm -hmm. and my parents came to Florida as immigrants from Bombay, India, as uh, Parsis who uh, were Zoroastrians and their, their community there and came to start a new life in, in America. So they were, they were excited. Uh, in 1980, I was born a year later, and I have two sisters uh, who are younger than I am. So, yeah, we were raised in a, in a in a cultural environment that was in in Florida, which was primarily uh, being in Central Florida, uh, Hispanic, Caucasian. I mean, we were a handful of Indians mm. uh, of Indian descent in in the elementary, middle, and high schools. So we were needing to educate or, or, or when someone asked who we are, mm -hmm. we would have to help them understand uh, that one sentence in the Egyptian history book that talks about something to do with Persians <laughs> as maybe Zoroastrians are mentioned and we'd, we'd yeah. talk about it. Well, uh, and, and in the Orlando area in Central mm -hmm. Florida, we had uh, a few families that would get together mm -hmm. and our parents made it a point to help uh, educate the younger generation as to what the history, cultural heritage uh, are for, for Zoroastrians. So, so there were other Zoroastrians where you grew up in Orlando? Uh, uh, that's right. We had to drive anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes, uh, but we'd have birthday parties at their houses and kind of get, get together. So that, that takes effort to what get out of What kind of your celebrations world. do you remember doing as a child? Sure, we'd often celebrate, in addition to birthdays, we'd yeah. celebrate Nowruz, Nowruz as the spring, first, uh, first day of spring. Wow. And uh, that would that be one, one day. And, and often in August, the Nowruz which for a subsect, one group of Zoroastrians mm -hmm. that follow the calendar that starts in August as the first day of the year, that'll be another uh, new year. Wow. Uh, and, so and was the there some that, overlap yeah. with the Persian culture and, and the Zoroastrian culture? 
there is a lot of overlap where the Persians in that geographic area would celebrate the first day of spring as Nowruz. Yeah. As the Zoroastrians emigrated to other contexts, especially India, those Zoroastrians actually forgot to add a month every 120 years, mm. <laughs> which we, we typically add one day every four years, or you can add a 30 day month every 120 years. Over time, that was forgotten so that there is this gap in between the March New Year mm. of the spring context, so it's seasonal versus an, uh, an August New Year, and then we basically have that, and there's actually a third group, the Kudmi. So you have the Fusli uh, calendar, the seasonal calendar, and the Fusli uh, Zoroastrians follow the March New Year. The, uh, um, the, the, the There's a Shenshai calendar, which follows the King's calendar, the Shah's calendar in August. The Kadmis are uh, the other third group. Uh, again, they're all, we all say the same prayers. We all follow the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's simply a calendar. Dis Interesting. Difference. So uh, your parents must be really proud of you. Tell me about all your academic credentials and your accomplishments there. Oh, thanks. I, I hope they are. Uh, <laughs> it, it's really because of them. I mean, I my sisters got smarter than I am. They, they went to Ivy League schools right off the bat as uh, undergrads. I started at University of Florida, was electrical engineering uh, major and was a minor in music, mm -hmm. uh, clarinet uh, was a clarinet performance uh, minor. So I played a lot, jazz band, orchestras, concert bands, marching bands. So I have that music side as well as being an, an engineer. And along the way, I realized I'm really interested in combining the technical acoustic aspects of sound mm. with helping people with how do I combine that with the art of music. And so my graduate program is in speech and hearing bioscience and technology, which was a way for me to get into the healthcare sector as an engineer. And I'm now a principal investigator. I, I am a PI of a lab uh, here at Mass General Hospital mm. in Boston, which is Harvard affiliated to study voice and speech disorders and how we can better create technologies and assess people uh, who come in the door to our clinic. Okay, have, so you uh, have a um, master's degree in, say, the... the a master, so I have a bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering. Uh -huh. And I have a PhD in speech and hearing bioscience and technology, which is a mouthful, but it's a biomedical engineering. Yeah. Uh, wow, that sounds fascinating. That's a whole other interview for another day. I would a whole other interview, <laughs> but it sets, the, it, is, it sets the stage for the what we are going to talk about mostly, which is representing Zoroastrianism mm -hmm. as a chaplain at Harvard University and MIT mm. and how I got to that that uh, that role. Yeah. Uh, in addition to being on the academic side, I, I'm a research scientist and I m help in the administration of a doctoral program uh, in in this speech and mm. hearing uh, area. So I've always tried to be active and well read in Zoroastrian uh, scriptures and and history and throughout my graduate time here at MIT there were about a dozen Zoroastrians who would try to get together not just have social outings but we'd also invite scholars of the faith to speak to us mm -hmm. I also delved deeper there was a Gatha study group that we uh, put together uh, once a month and dive into the scriptures and the various interpretations of the Avesta. Uh, and through that, while I was a student, I then graduated in 2010, uh, January, uh, defended in 2010, uh, January. And Cyrus Mehta, uh, Dr. Mehta, where, where there's a relation through my, mom, my mom's side, he was representing Zoroastrianism at Harvard and MIT in an interfaith context for 15 years prior. Mm. And he asked me uh, whether I wanted to continue in that role so he would tr transition uh, and step back a little bit. So and sorry, I really... I'm going to stop you. Cyrus Mehta was a professor? 
Cyrus Mars was and is a professor at Harvard in the oh. biostatistics department. And he's Persian. And he is Persian. He's Zoroastrian oh, cool. uh, from the Indian context as well. So awesome. yeah, we call ourselves Persian uh, uh, by heritage. I believe Avija, your your heritage is more closely Iranian uh, and Persian early, uh, more recently than than our ancestors, who were who were the immigrants from Persia to oh, uh, India. So yeah. we, being uh, Persian heritage but our indian america uh, indian um uh, okay more recently, yeah within the last thousand years or so that makes sense okay so cyrus passed the baton to you yes he passed <laughs> the baton and why zoroastrians were invited to the table to represent a minority faith among what is now almost 35 to 40 chaplains mm. at harvard and mit and many institutions academic institutions have interfaith uh uh in centers to serve students undergrad and, and graduate students and cyrus was invited by the swamiji at the time to he, that, that advocated for a zoroastrian voice mm -hmm. uh, being that zoroastrians at almost were the the first monotheistic religion and helped influence the other Abrahamic faiths, Islam and uh, Judaism and Christianity. Mm. So that was the seed that then grew into what I eventually said, you know, I, even though I'm not ordained, Cyrus Metha was not ordained, we're not priests, we're hopefully well-read, good stewards of the faith, and I'm here at, at Harvard anyway, uh, so it, felt right for me to say, all right, let's do it. And it's been an amazing experience for almost 15 years now. It's about 14 years being in this role where I talk to students and I talk to faculty and other chaplains to help them understand who we are. And then just, we have to talk across, uh, across faiths because now almost more than ever, th this is a, every year is challenging and we continue to need skill sets to be able to talk across and understand there are commonalities and there are differences. Mm -hmm. And we as uh, religious and non-religious leaders have a unique skill set to bring to an academic context. So students feel comfortable mm -hmm. in these really tough conversations uh, uh, in, in terms of maybe they're trying to find their way and they don't know mm -hmm. who they want to be. They're reading multiple, uh, uh, they're reading the Bible, they're reading the Quran, they're reading uh, the, uh, the the various meditations and and their searching and that's mm -hmm. I've uh, what students are meant to do mm -hmm. there in this uh, context. Have you so, seen anyone convert to Zoroastrianism? I have met and know of those who have converted uh, and have gone through the Sadra Pushi or or, or the uh, Navjot uh, ceremony. Mm -hmm. And not many priests do that. There are many in California specifically that uh, have a process and protocol. Mm. Uh, it's from what I know, not common, at least in the American uh, context, but there, there, is a, uh, there is a path. And I, I love that to be more of a path. I mean, from I absolutely person, agree. Personal. This is something that we can um, maybe encourage people to do, at least to you know, keep the philosophies alive and to keep people informed about it. One of the stories that I did as a reporter in Spectrum News, which you saw was the Zoroastrian Church in Orange County. And I'd love to hear your thoughts of what um, the head of that church was saying. He's, he was saying that whenever there is some turmoil with the government in Iran, he's seeing a resurgence of young people searching for their roots, mainly Iranians. Iranians and and going back to maybe what their uh, ancestors who probably were Zoroastrian and that they're rediscovering that that faith and if the question is whether I am okay with that or whether some people say no we 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 can't just have <laughs> a, a million people uh, uh, overnight be Zoroastrian because that would that would dominate the, the the current look and feel I I would say. Let's, I mean, go for it. I mean, mm -hmm. I, the, the certain ways of thinking of 
keeping the look and the feel in a certain way. Mm -hmm. I see that, whether it's food, mm -hmm. clothing, language is huge. Uh, I don't speak Farsi, and when I uh, enter a certain context, uh, Zoroastrian uh, Anjumans or communities mm -hmm. in America, I can see that there are some, many in the Iranian uh, Zoroastrian communities that need that language because of very strong connection uh, to uh, not speaking uh, uh, the English as much, and the Parsis and Iranians have to coexist uh, together. Mm -hmm. And, and work through that, whether it's programs in both languages and, uh, but the prayers are the same. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's our common bond. So I would personally, I'd welcome having uh, those in Iran who are rediscovering or discovering Zoroastrianism and to, to read about it and realize that this resonates with, with them. That, that's what Zarathustra did. Uh, 3,500 years ago. So we're mm -hmm. uh, maybe rediscovering that because the Indian context has uh, four, four reasons. They're, they're not irrational, but to, to protect the community in certain environments has been critical to allow the continuity uh, mm -hmm. of Zoroastrianism in, in a certain context. On the flip side, that has prevented the the welcoming feel of, of quote unquote others, whether mm -hmm. you marry a non Zoroastrian and are your kids Zoroastrian, whether the, they can do their, their Navjot, uh, or the, the, the case of converting, mm -hmm. that all of that is, uh, has legal implications instead of simply. But don't well Zoroastrians fear that the numbers will eventually dwindle into nothing? There is, uh, well, the, the Fizana Journal just had a, uh, uh, and then last summer, the uh, issue, uh, I was guest editor of part of that issue where we profiled many in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math to, uh, uh, to highlight Zoroastrians. But the other part of that issue was a survey that was sent out globally to understand demographics, mm -hmm. where we are now, and Part of that conversation is the numbers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And we may already be on that train where it's mm. uh, going to be uh, very close to a, a, a religion that is going to not be in existence. Now, that is always a conversation that as being a danger and it's a risk uh, and, and mm -hmm. for that struggle between, well, that means we should invite many to convert or we should invite our interfaith couples who have kids, celebrate them and have their kids if they want to be, to be Zoroastrian and not, and not say you can't be, you can't be. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and others say, well, th this is about simple statistics. If you are uh, in a family and you have a certain mortality rate and uh, there are a certain number of kids per family, you're just not going to make up the difference over time. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there are, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert in, in that, that in, in terms of uh, demographics and replacement rate, mm -hmm. but it does seem that if we are not adding numbers, right. then sure, the religion And at least we can small. preserve the knowledge, you know, the philosophy, at least we can preserve the history somehow. And which is why it's so great to, you know, like you said, educate people. I would say for me personally, about half of the people I ever speak to don't know what that is, Zoroastrianism. They don't, they've never heard of it. Is that the experience for you? And if it is, how would you describe it to people who don't, who've never heard of it? Uh, sure. Uh, that's a high number. That's great. I mean, if half of the people know <laughs> of, of Zoroastrians, then that's great. Uh, it, it tends to be a much smaller percentage uh, when I uh, when I speak with people. <laughs> so they say, all right, like you just asked, tell me what does it mean to be Zoroastrian? Yeah. And uh, the, uh, the the usual bumper sticker comes up and I say, well, you put a bumper sticker on the car. It's good thoughts, good words and good deeds. Mm -hmm. You talk to anybody who is Zoroastrian, that is the motto. Mm -hmm. Starting with that and that the history uh, begins with a prophet who spoke to a single entity 
uh, who is the Lord of wisdom or this, this entity who is all knowledgeable, all wise, but not all powerful. So not an omnipotent mm. being, which is key because we are here as humans to continue to fight against the uh, the, the dark side, the evil uh, mm. influences, the evil spirit that entered this perfect world early on, and we're constantly fighting against that light over dark. So the symbolism of light and candles and fire being a very important uh, natural element that we pray in the presence of because mm -hmm. the fire provides light mm -hmm. and warmth and, um, and light being a very uh, strong symbol of knowledge and it's all about knowledge. And being a scientist myself, it is not a discrepancy to, a discrepancy to say I am both faithful and I have, I am a scientist as well. Because mm -hmm. some try to say like, how can you be both? Believe in this being or mm -hmm. believe in some God and also be uh, an empirical, uh, empirically based person. I say, well, it, it's very harmonious, mm -hmm. especially in, in Zoroastrianism. We want Asha. We want to find the truth. Yeah. And that is... That's a start to what well what I, can you show me or name one scientist in the world that has proven that god does or does not exist <laughs> i i cannot name one right now okay uh, i cannot i, I don't uh, think they exist so <laughs> even even the biggest um known scientists in the world cannot prove how the universe started correct that's right. We have tools, and and being at, at, at uh, near MIT and at MIT, there are scientists that have ears to listen for gravitational waves from the beginning of the from the Big Bang time. So it's exciting that there are ways to find tidbits and breadcrumbs of what the beginnings of of the universe were. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we're still finding out more and more. And in my opinion, whether we prove or disprove this idea of a of mm -hmm. a being that is able to be all knowledgeable and all wise, for me, it, it it's a comfort level. It gives the ability to live life in a certain way, to be a good person. The second, the, the first prayer is about goodness and mm -hmm. and being good for the sake of of, of goodness. And the second prayer being about others. Mm -hmm. It's it's immediately looking outward and saying, how do I help others, especially others who are less fortunate, others in need? Yeah. Uh, that, it's it's about the, radiating oh, you know. that light outwards. It's not just you yes. light your own candle, you radiate outwards, which I love that the most. I really, yes. truly believe in that. And you don't have to be of any religion really to adopt that philosophy right no we're not unique in that way and, right. and we just take a certain tack to uh, address it and but but it, yeah you're right it, religions are about love and taking care of the needy taking care of people uh there's a lot of commonality mm -hmm. uh and and at the same time there's a lot of the a different approach and that's where religions mm -hmm. uh and uh, we have a very strong uh, non-religious uh, humanist presence uh, on campus, which is great because we're able to really understand how we're, we're very close to the humanists. I mean, Zoroastrians think about ethical questions mm -hmm. and uh, being close to animals and plants mm -hmm. and that if you do something, there are consequences. And that's, that's how we, we think about life. You, you have your own, this is the other thing I, I make sure I tell people is he, we as humans have this amazing uh, responsibility to to make decisions, but there are consequences to those decisions. There are there are uh, uh, there are rights and wrongs that we have to understand. If we do things that are on the right side, then that's good, and the the wrong decisions get us closer to what we really don't want to go. So yeah, you think for but, yourself. Yes, you think, you think for, for yourself. yourself. So the the prophet uh, Zarathustra or or Zoroaster are they the same? Exactly the same. Okay. One is the Persian uh, name, the other is the Greek. Gotcha. Okay, did he really exist? I 
in in conversation reading i will say yes okay <laughs> for now i mean i i don't have uh, you know evidence in okay. front of me <laughs> but in terms of how we have uh, come to where yeah. we are today this was a person yeah who was a real uh, a, a man who was uh, mortal and was born raised in a family and then at some point later in his life mid mid career he said i need to take a break and 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 walk and then that's when he uh, communed and and uh, found this this ability to commune with god and that's where he then started to ask mm -hmm. questions that became our our gathas the the, the yeah. question answer question answer and that's that's and what, you said that well, it has been a, a foundation for many other religions as well so it's it's kind of a universal concept it's almost like a timeless modern universal it, it is the the concept of paradise for example that christians uh you read about uh the perfect garden of eden mm -hmm. with adam and eve uh the word para paradise comes from persian mm -hmm. paradai uh, what, I, what i read is paradaiso mm -hmm which came from the Zoroastrian context. We have a similar concept of a heaven and hell. And, uh, and before, the, at, at the beginning, everything was good. And there was a Garden of Eden that was perfect. And then out of, out of outside of that context, where Ahura Mazda uh, created the creations, that's when Angra Mainyo, the evil spirit, entered outside and then planted the seeds that were now constantly fighting against mm -hmm. of untruths and uh and people that uh that that think a certain way we try to help them mm. think good thoughts and good words and good deeds so, so i want to yes. switch gears and ask about your family um tell me like so were your family moved out of persia or iran into india my ancestors uh, -huh. uh and i have not done the the, the lineage history it's okay. that search i should <laughs> but in 640 in the common era 640 a.d mm -hmm. there was a migration from persia uh -huh. as the islamic conquest was happening mm -hmm. and the, the immigrants that left persia now iran to the west banks of india mm -hmm. and gujarat that's my historical uh, my, my my lineage comes from those immigrants mm. that left Persia to India and the Indians in uh, in that context had to uh, there there are uh, legends and stories about uh, how they were accepted uh, that the Raja at the time uh, the king said we have no room for you and then our leader mm. said look we will sweeten the pot we will not disrupt we will get married in the evening we will <laughs> uh, contribute we'll even wear your drill we'll wear saris we'll, we'll, we'll look like indians but we will preserve our faith and so uh, a, a glass of milk was filled to the brim by the king and provided to the leader and said look we're full and our leader said i will pour sugar bring sugar and he poured sugar into that uh, full cup and the sugar did not make it overflow, but it uh, assimilated and but made it a sweeter uh, mm. community. So that that metaphor. Was, I love that story. Uh, so yes, the, your people, yeah. my people. So we were persecuted, right? Why yes. didn't the Islamists and the Muslims just let the Zoroastrians just be? Why did they have to flee? The, I, I'd have to read it to give you. Okay, uh, that's okay. You don't even have to answer. Accurate them. answers <laughs> in terms of why the Islamic, uh, uh, the the leaders at the time, it was not just Zoroastrians, anyone who was non-Muslim, uh -huh. and the Baha'is now in Iran are as persecuted as anyone else. And and the Baha'is think about education as a pillar and mm -hmm. talk about another community that is, is, uh, is struggling, uh, in, in Iran, mm. uh, as, as a, I'm just giving an example of yeah. a non Zoroastrian. It's not just Zoroastrians who, uh, have to uh, manage. And, and so, so to answer yeah. your question at the time, 
if you're a non-Muslim, you either convert to, to Islam, right, converted to Islam, or you would pay a tax. And so there's a financial incentive to either uh, leave because you can't pay the tax mm -hmm. or you're, cl you're, you're very faithful and you don't want to convert to, uh, uh, to, to another religion. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm giving reasons of why the, the migration happened, yeah. but I, in terms of the Islamic, Islamic side, why they didn't allow a multi-faith env uh, environment and community, I, I don't want to, I'll be honest and say, I don't want to give a, an answer now because I don't know the yeah. uh, rationale. Well, it's uh, just, it's just a sad situation. My empathy goes to the people, you know, um, it's, it's a tale as old as time, you know, and it, it, it still goes on. And yeah. so oh, what or, are or, some or, of the biggest like debates going on that you've heard? Like you said, one was allow more people in or keep it the way it is. What are some other perhaps debates or misconceptions or other things people are grappling with? Uh, that That's one of the uh, main debates that have been going on for many, many, many years, mm -hmm. I know up to a century that uh, about, uh, and that's again in the Indian context of so the Parsis mm -hmm. being the Indian Zoroastrians. Uh, the Parsi is uh, primarily centralized in Bombay because there is a, a hierarchical structure there where there are priests and uh, a, a, a group of leaders that pass down basically policies that have to be followed. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can't live in certain places. Uh, and there are laws if whether you can keep real estate based on whether you marry a certain individual. So. That's why lines are drawn. So that that is one of the like you have said, it's one of these like debates of, mm. of or, or or a yeah a, a, a debate when you get Zoroastrians yeah. together. One now, last July, la, la, oh, I'll tell you another. I'll tell you another one. Yeah. Uh, uh, because last July we had a gathering of uh, a congress of Zoroastrians from uh, from all over, uh, and this was a World Zoroastrian Congress mm -hmm. uh, in New York City. And that's where much many of these conversations uh, come mm -hmm. uh, as the, the hot topic conversations. And, and another that there are many I, that come to mind. Another, I think, very important one is how we help uh, speaking of those in, in need, how we help those in the LGBTQIA plus plus community mm. because they have been marginalized mm -hmm. in hist historically mm -hmm. uh, by uh, Wow. Uh, it, so where do uh, where do Zoroastrians stand on that? Uh, what is there is belief? no I mean, there's there is uh, in terms of the scripture, it's it, it it's the, the original Gata is pretty. I, I would say we just love thy neighbor and mm -hmm. you love everybody just and then you make minded. decisions. Yeah. Maybe you're open minded and progressive. Uh, later, certain scriptures will uh, comment on a man being with another man or a uh, it's usually that i i'm trying to remember if there's a woman with another woman for example being gay or lesbian and and how to uh how to view that relationship mm -hmm. uh so but those are later i wouldn't call them scriptures those are later writings uh from not from the original uh gatas but I'm raising that as talk about a, a really important issue. Yeah. And we had a amazing panelists uh, at the Congress last year who were talking about lived experiences and how family reacts and how the community reacts. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think we're we're getting there, but a lot of work to do to. to yeah. Help. So uh, how uh, is it the Harvard community embracing Zoroastrianism? Walk me through what your group does. What do you, do you how often do you meet? Tell me a little bit more of the details. Sure. No, thanks uh, yeah. for asking because the the, the college age students uh -huh. uh, getting together uh, they, that I've, I've been having grown up in the Boston area, mm -hmm. especially I've, I've seen uh, it look many different ways and we often have to pull from multiple colleges because we may have one or two from Harvard, one or two from MIT, Boston University, Northeastern University, mm -hmm. Tufts, Brandeis, uh, and then we'll get probably 
12 to 15 uh, students who want to get together and, and either socialize uh, or, or be more, do more of a, an academic uh, exercise, uh, exercise. So we are in the context of about, I would say, 250 to 300 uh, community members in the greater Boston area wow. uh, that put together four, four, three to four large events uh, every, uh, every year that are either New Year's or holiday uh, get-togethers uh, with some of those, uh, including a jushan, where we consecrate that time before we do more of the partying atmosphere. So it'd be... So, so that that's where the college students and the young adults are able to be a part of the the, the community, which is not large. We don't we don't have a a building a darbemher mm-hmm. that other communities have in in North America. So we have to rent halls, whether community centers mm-hmm. or churches or synagogues, and and use those spaces. Uh, so yeah, so the college age students, I uh, was just uh, in conversation with, with a couple of them recently they'll they'll try to get together i whenever they want it could be every month it could be mm. a couple times I, there'll be phases when in there it's a little more a little more interest to, to get to get together so mm. yeah it's up to them what so as a as a researcher as an academic as a very intellectual person that you are what are some of the things that you want to learn more about within the religion are there any mysterious points that you're like, gosh, I really wish somebody would research this, or I'd love to know more about this. Yeah, what, I mean, I, I know I don't know, I don't have barely scratching the surface, even though I've begun to learn as much as I can about uh, old Avestan, and we literally have to basically be bilingual and know another language to know what our prayers are. Mm. So when I'm teaching this, 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 these prayers to my kids at the nighttime, I want them to know what every word means. So they're not just thinking of this as a foreign tongue and we're singing and praying, I think. And, uh, so I, that, that's one thing I, I'd like to continue to, you know, figure out how do we, how do we best educate our our community and and our kids especially mm-hmm. because I don't believe we have a good model like uh, the Jewish community does mm. at educating our kids from the get go in terms of language uh, to to be able to immediately go into the native tongue and then be able to read scripture. Does uh, does Google Translate help with this or no? I. I have not seen Avestan as an option for Google Translate. Uh, <laughs> now, is that the name of the language, Avestan? So the uh, that that is right. Uh, so the original language that Zarathustra uh, spoke in uh, did not write in. So writing happened a couple thousand years later, mm. twenty five hundred years later, in uh, around eleven hundred A.D. That's when pen got to paper. Not really pen, but mm. uh, writing happened. So the religion was oral for thousands of years mm. and the Persian old Persian uh, is old Avestan and old Avestan over the uh, hundreds and thousands of years turned into middle Avestan or Pahlavi to young Avestan and, uh, and and the more recent uh, Persian uh, language mm-hmm. uh, Farsi and Sans- Sanskrit from the Indic side is a sister or cousin of of wow. Avestan. Yeah, so, that's going to take yeah. a lot of research to to really translate the original prayers. <laughs> and that's also a, can be a debate, though, whether is this word actually mean this or yeah. something else. And um, I mean, one debate that I get a lot because the, the story I did on the um, Orange County Zoroastrian Church, I got about ten thousand comments, and people were trying to dispute and debate whether this is a the first monotheistic religion. And I said, yes, it predates Islam and Christianity and Judaism. That's a fact, right? That's what we what, what we believe, yes. Yeah, yeah. and you know, they have also, um, I get some misconceptions about, you know, what's modern about worshiping fire? And, and I always answer with, 
Well, it's not worshiping fire. It's it's a symbol of light. That's right. My uh, my grandfather would say the same thing. Uh, he was a dasturji or high priest uh, in Bombay, mm. uh, and would often get these types of questions, like, "Why do you uh, pray in front of the fire? Uh, are you are you worshiping fire?" Uh, another question would be, "Is what is heaven and hell and are they places physically or, and he would say there are states of mind. Mm. There's a good place and, and a not so good place that you will be, uh, you know, in the later life would be uh, going to your, your spirit goes to. Uh, but yeah, I know you're right. This, uh, I think the misconceptions that they're, they've been around many, many years. We say the same thing that, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're as much fire worshipers as Christians or cross worshipers. Because they don't worship the cross either. We don't worship fire. <laughs> That's right. In terms of, That's, yeah, um, absolutely correct. So what are some of the most important things that you teach your kids about this religion? Besides just like translating the prayers for them, what would you want future generations of not only your children, but maybe people listening to this to know? Oh, thanks, Avisha. I, I would say providing a spark and being a role model because kids often do not do what you say, but they will do what you do. Mm. Maybe not at that moment, but when you're not looking, <laughs> they do what you have done. And for the past decade uh, at Harvard, we have an annual service project that gathers about 300 to 400 volunteers over the span of the, of the day, about five hours during the day, to come together and pack meals for the hungry so that then they're distributed to food pantries mm. uh, in, the, in the New England area. That event, to me, is a microcosm of what I want our kids to be a part of because my kids have been doing it since they were two years old mm. and to, for them they want to do it they look forward to it they say how can i help they get their hands dirty they want to move boxes and dollies they're scooping macaroni or rice Aww. and pasta <laughs> into bags and sealing them helping others know what to do because it's an assembly line and we have rotations of this assembly line so uh, i have a son and daughter, uh, and, and they're now uh, eight and 10. And the that gives me hope. Mm -hmm. That spark. Well, that'll this, teach them not to be entitled, uh, right? Growing yeah, up exactly. so privileged. <laughs> I know. I, I uh, And you brought up a good point, which is, uh, and I've asked my wife uh, this uh, often, is how do we provide our kids with not struggle, but they should not feel like, oh, I have everything. I but we want them to feel like, what do, What would you do with limited resources? Mm -hmm. How would you be creative? How do you help other people who don't have uh, access to what we have? Yeah, and that'll so help that, build resilience for them. It'll yes. serve them uh, better. That That's what I hope we all learn in our lives is resilience, grit, that everything is not just handed to us. Uh, mm -hmm. There is this, uh, on the other hand, when you do need to hand other people things, absolutely do it. Mm -hmm. uh, there are there, the, a leg up is something that uh, we are charged to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, yeah, we need it, that this idea of, of of the giving spirit and being resilient our, ourselves. So hopefully that helps. Uh, I could go on, but yeah. the, the, the this idea of modeling service to others, and so our kids will do it because it's just you just do it. You yeah. don't have to think about it twice. That's what I, one of the number one things that, yeah, I think will. That's beautiful. That's amazing. So this is the last question. If there's anything else you'd like to add, if there's anything we miss that anyone, you know, a message for the audience, just uh, now's your chance. Now's my chance. Uh, <laughs> well, I mentioned having two young kids and yeah. helping them navigate this crazy world that gets crazier and crazier. Yeah. Uh, social media and their mm. interaction with social media, I think is a huge topic. Oh, yeah, of, of conversation that we're just beginning. Uh, and it, it impacts us all. How do we handle 
information yeah. and what is true, what's not true. Uh, I just wanted to kind of talk through that as, as a, yeah. as, as one uh, topic to continue to put at the forefront. And now with, you know, being a scientist and engineer, uh, artificial intelligence and machine mm -hmm. learning are huge topics because they, that's influencing our minute to minute life. Oh my goodness. And how do we yeah. ethically uh, move forward uh, with, yeah. with a AI among us? Uh, I wonder if AI could paint a picture or make a movie of what it was like being in those ancient times. With, that's, yeah, <laughs> living it, with Zarathustra, because somebody that, should make a movie about that. <laughs> uh, there is a movie. Is there? Uh, called On Wings of Fire. Oh. And if your audience hasn't uh, heard about it, yeah. that is a movie. And my son was just learning about it in his, uh, we have Sunday school once a month. Uh -huh. Uh, for our community, uh, and I failed to mention one of my hats, which is teaching the first class. These are four-year-olds, five-year-olds, and six-year-olds that come together. There are about 14 in that class, come together once a month, and, uh, and, and my son's in the older age bracket. And he learned about this documentary. Wait, what do you teach movie. them? Sorry. Oh, yeah. We, we, what do we teach them? We teach them the, uh, the, the basics of being a, a Zoroastrian. Oh, so it's like a it's like a Zoroastrian Sunday school. It's a Zoroastrian Sunday school. Oh my school gosh. Okay, cool. Go on. About, so, did you show this movie to the kids? So, for the older age group, uh, the ten and above, the uh, snippets of the movie that that's on YouTube. It's it's free uh, on Wings of Fire. I believe the director is Cyrus Barucha. Who? Uh, if I have my memory. Do you recommend before. this movie? Uh, I have I recommend it because okay. you were you were saying what what if we had a movie about Zarathustra yeah. and what how he uh, spread the word to the king at the time how he communed with God and that's exactly what this movie is about. That's amazing because the uh, other one uh, about the Persian Empire uh, with the Cyrus the Great wasn't there one made like three hundred or something like that. I didn't watch that one because I I didn't think it would be historically accurate. I did not watch 300. I know of the movie. It is a that that's that's a, that's a Hollywood blockbuster. <laughs> it's a Hollywood I, version, right? <laughs> yes, and and there was. I think you're also referring to another movie, uh, which was I can't remember the title. Which was about Alexander the Great. Yes. And, yeah. Uh, that may have been Alexander uh, and how and Zoroastrians feature prominently. And that that's a tough movie to watch as a Zoroastrian, mm -hmm. uh, because it was about the end of, of, uh, yeah. of a large empire right. that uh, Alexander uh, defeated. And uh, and I'm always corrected because I think that, oh man, uh, Alexander took over and uh, he, he's considered one of these uh, evil spirits. Uh, but on the other hand, any empire has their own blood on their hands, mm -hmm. even the Zoroastrian empires when they took over certain areas mm. 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, I think we have to make sure we understand that they also took over in a similar way. We may not have all the, the pictures and the video about it, but yeah, that, I think that's, that's, uh, that's human. Uh, you mm. mentioned that's human nature, that, that this is, a, this, this will constantly, this vicious cycle of, uh, quote unquote, taking over and, and being the dominant mm -hmm. religion versus, versus not. But yeah, you're right. Alexander was one, 300 was one, uh, but on wings of fire is less of a big budget document, uh, big budget movie. This is, this is really about, uh, trying to put characters to the beginning yeah. of our faith That's and amazing. acting out how it could have been. So yeah, yeah. highly recommend it. One question came to my mind right now while you were talking, you know, and it's about, the, the times that we're living, like you said, a lot of technology, AI, um, social media, our kids are going to be, you know, a little bit, not a little bit, they're going to be a lot challenged by social media. I'm often happy when I was a teenager, it wasn't there. But, um, you know, and, and you are such an accomplished person, you know, you went to these amazing schools and 
there's so many people around the world that don't have these opportunities. There's so many young people struggling. And, you know, my heart goes out to them. What, what would you say to those people, maybe going through pain, going through struggle? I always preface it to say I am not a... <laughs> I'm not a therapist. I'm not a uh, ordained priest. I'm not a psychiatrist. Uh, I'm not an MD. I'm a PhD. Uh, <laughs> Do you really science. preface your questions with all? Of <laughs> I, I preface my answers with I am not each of these. <laughs> but as you found out over the course of the last hour we've spoken, I have hopefully have been able to both read, be well read, and have some experience to mm. pass on. There are strategies to mm -hmm. get through tough times, mm -hmm. whether it's externalizing what's internalized as a, uh, a, a strife mm -hmm. and in externalizing something, put it in its place, not say that it doesn't exist, but just say like, all right, I recognize this thing that's in me, but I will mm -hmm. say, all right, you're there, but I'm going to minimize you. Uh, and you can personify it, uh, that, that may help some people, uh, and others may need some constant repetition. Uh, this is what the Hindus call the, the meditative say, Om, uh, just focusing mm, on a mantra, vi vi a mantra, a mantra, a, uh, vibration mm -hmm. and vibrations. When we pray, I tell my kids, it's not just the words that you, you're reading, but, uh, or, or singing, but it's really feel how it is giving your body a, a vibration and that vibration can feel mm. soothing and comforting. Yeah. Energy so, and, and, and somatics. Yes. The yeah. somatic sense, somatosensory aspect yeah. will then feed us. And then the mental part is then fed by focusing on a singular uh, idea mm. and I, I remember reading about how to meditate. That was part of my going through college is let me, you know, I, as you found out, I, I need to read things. So I go to the <laughs> library or the bookstore, <laughs> find the section on meditation. I need to know how, how, how do I meditate? How do, and, and, mm -hmm. and it, it is about thinking about your mind as a, uh, uh, an ocean and there's a mm -hmm. storm that can brew over those waters. And that happens throughout life. Mm -hmm. And to help us get through that, we focus and allow ourselves to calm the waters so that we can see deep. And the truth is that is, is in us. Once you see down into the water to the, the core, the solution is with us. Mm. And that's where we're, when we pray to God, we can look up if we want, but it's really uh, these atma. I think the Hindus have the word atma. We have the soul within us. Like the the, the answers are, are all, all inside of us. Mm -hmm. So we can look up or we can look inward. And that helps, can help uh, get out of. Mm. Uh, I love that. Those are beautiful, absolutely beautiful techniques. And I wonder in the context of Zoroastrianism, what wisdom we can leave them with now from Zoroastrian philosophy for happiness. The Hashem Vohu prayer, uh, when I, I, I teach to the four to six year olds, I want them to know what each word means because it's such a short prayer. Hashem Vohu, truth or Asha is good. It is not only good, it is Vahishta, Vahishtam Asti. It is the best. Ushta Asti, and you mentioned Ushta, which is happiness. Mm -hmm. So truth is good, it is the best, and it is happiness. And then the key is that happiness comes to him or her who is good for the sake of that best truth. Mm. And that is Ashem Vohu, word for word, to help those who know that prayer to, to, to say it over and over again mm. and to understand what it means because that will help them get out of the, uh, the challenging uh, mm. situation. We will, I mean, we, we, we help them. That's a yatao hu prayer. We will help those 
but ultimately it is we who you mentioned, we have to make the decisions. Yes. We are the ones who will take the steps. Uh, we ultimately answer to ourselves. Yeah. And we will help ourselves. Absolutely. I love it. Cause there's been a Harvard study on happiness and I, I think it's been proven. It doesn't come from external things. It doesn't come from your titles or your money. Correct. It doesn't come from that. It comes from your circle of friends, your family that, uh, give feed feed you uh in that and you feed your soul and that gives you happiness right very well said beautiful thank you so much thanks i really appreciate it and i'll talk to you soon